too, just in case. At the very end, maybe people might have a question for the Reverend. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Turner, thank you for joining us from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Brother, could you please tell people a little bit about your background and, and what brings you here today? Thank you so much for having me, Mr. Black. I am a, a Tuskegee native of Alabama, uh, the great state of Alabama. I was born in John Andrew Hospital, the oldest and last black hospital in Alabama. Also the hospital where our U.S. government uh, administered the Tuskegee syphilis study, um, watching black men suffer um, with no giving them no penicillin. Um, also the place where Rosa Parks was born, also the place where Lionel Richie learned to play and the Commodores formed up and the Tuskegee Airmen learned to fly. I love my hometown, Booger T. Washington, George Washington Carver, all those guys. And the town is still less than 12,000 people. Um, but it just shows you how rich a, a culture is. You don't need a whole lot of people to do wonderful things. Um, left there, went to Alabama, University of Alabama Road Tide. Um, same school that George Wallace stood in the schoolhouse door of. Um, I graduated from while I was a student there. I was a student activist, uh, led several marches, um, was called the N-word too many times to count. Um, law school professor discovered that this university had slaves buried on campus. And uh, me and two other students uh, led a movement to get them recognized and get them. We had a memorial service for them. Um, and there's a plaque there with their honor, with, with their name on it to this day. Um, went to uh, law school immediately after undergrad. Uh, then I got my call to ministry and I left, tough decision in my life. And I left the country, I went to Kenya, went to the motherland um, and I was a missionary. I was, and I saw just miraculous things and I fell even deeper in love with my people. Came back from the mission trip, went to New Orleans at the Hurricane Katrina, helped serve people in New Orleans. Um, I saw poverty at its worst, uh, even worse, really, than what I saw in Kenya was what I saw when I came back to America, New Orleans. Uh, it was terrible. Um, then started seminary and got married and uh, been working poli in political campaigns a little bit. Then kind of got a little disenchanted with party politics. That's a whole nother conversation. And uh, from there, I got my doctorate ministry uh, focused on prophetic civic engagement um, went to Egypt, went to, back to the motherland, went to Egypt, uh, studied with monks, went to monasteries, um, saw pharaohs in the museum in, in Cairo, um, saw beautiful black hair, you know, so don't let anybody tell you Cleopatra was a white woman. Liz Claiborne is not Cleopatra. <laughs> Charleston Heston is not Moses. Those pharaohs look like you and I. They had their hair uh, is locked to, still to this day, thousands of hundreds of thousands of years later. Their hair is still locked in those coffins. Um, beautiful hair. Um, and came back here, pastored. Uh, most of my ministry has been in Alabama. Uh, recently, in 2017, got called to come out here to Tulsa. Um, and when I came to Tulsa, it was, it was you know, 2017, before anybody was talking about the, the centennial, the massacre, um, God inspired me to go out and to raise my voice. I was the first year I was here, I was looking for anybody who was speaking to this issue of reparations. And uh, God said, that's why I got you here. Mm. You know, and so I went out to City Hall because still in this city, city government meets on Wednesday, the first city in my entire ministry that has city council meetings on Wednesday. And I was told before I got here, that was done strategically to keep black folk from coming to city council meetings because they know on Wednesdays, most of us are in Bible study somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so God gave me the inspiration If they don't want us to come to city hall for Bible study, bring Bible study to city hall. And so that's what I did. And I've been having the same message every week, Isaiah 61, preaching about reparations, um, calling the city to recognize what she did, to repent of what she did and to give repair for what she did. And since I've been doing that by God's grace in the first Wednesday, I went out brother, I was by myself. All I had was a bullhorn in my Bible. That was it. Um, and then later on, it kind of just caught fire. News, documentaries, people started coming to just see a brother with a bullhorn in the Bible, you know, and, and just trying to speak truth to power. And we've changed how they term the massacre. Because at first when I came here, everybody called it a riot. Now they refer to it as it was a massacre, really attempted genocide. Um, there was no mass grave excavation. Uh, I raised voice to that, to the mayor, 
because the Washington Post article came out, and now we have a mass grave excavation committee. Um, before I, when I came, the lawsuit that was done originally by Professor Ogletree back in the early 2000s that was lost. Uh, now I found an attorney to to revisit that, and we uh, we, we were the original plaintiffs in that lawsuit. Um, and and the wind is at our back, and we're we're going full steam ahead. Just yesterday, uh, Wednesday, I uh, celebrated three years. A public protest, which is, and I haven't found anything older, uh, but it is the longest, if not the longest, one of the longest sustained movements, reparations in the history of our country. Uh, I don't know for anyone that's been weekly for the last three years, longer than three years, and just just yesterday we 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 celebrated doing that protest and marching every week now for over three years and i mean the rain the sleet the hail the snow uh i've had people call me just yesterday somebody called me uh, uh you know an n-word like a white woman just yelled it out a karen not even a karen just a straight up bigot just yelled out you know n-word really i don't want to offend your audience i know they, they probably never heard that word before um <laughs> but 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 it was it's been terrible i had people assault me throw water on me uh, lie on me. I, I've had Karen's lie on me as well, um, and it's and people insulting you, throwing credit cards at you. Uh, it's been a tumultuous time, um, but we continue to march on. Mm. I, I want to just take a second, just give it up, give it up for that, give it up for the, uh, give it up for the story, the trajectory of the story, give it up for the passion that you possess, give it up for your anointment. Give it up for uh, your focused uh, commitment to the issues, and and I, as I listen to you, Reverend, only thing I the first thing that pops in my head is so much you've done with your life, uh, and and it's an inspiration of anybody that's listening that 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 wonders what they can accomplish. You know, don't feel don't feel overwhelmed by all that he's accomplished and all that he's trying to do. Realize that you too can have an impact similar to the good Dr. Reverend, and, and that's what we should be focusing on. I know sometimes we hear people, I mean, your life just sounds extraordinary. All that you've been able to get involved in, people feel like, I could never do that. Well, yeah, you could. I'm sure he didn't set out initially to accomplish all these things, and somehow he finds himself at that place and, and looks back and says, wow, look at the look at the ground I've covered. Do Doctor, so, so you've been doing this protest for three years, and that's a protest for reparations, I understand. You know, not a lot of attention, as you pointed out, has been focused on the, on, on Tuskegee as of late. Most Americans had never heard of the massacre. Most folks, um, uh, how does it feel that it finally be hit like mainstream? What What was your reaction when when that happened? It was it was it was shocking. Um, first, it was shocking that people didn't know about it. I learned about it when I was in Alabama and in and, and, and undergrad. Um, but to come here and to be at ground zero and most of the folks here grew up not knowing about it. It just shows you, brother, um, I, as a community, and I love my people, I've been black all my life, but as a community, we've, we've tried to hide our suffering and our horror um, we try to shield that from our children. And being a father, I get it, but I don't subscribe to it. You know, I think one day I'm going to share with my boys the problems and issues daddy had. Why? Because I want them to not fall prey to those same things, right? And I think as a society, we, as a community, we, we and in Tulsa, it was because the, folk, the Black folk who did speak out were killed or ran out of town. I get it. You know, those folks who spoke out to white people about it, but that still shouldn't keep you from speaking about it to your own children, mm. you know, sharing that story. They had us so afraid. We were whispering about the massacre in our own houses in our own, in our own houses. We would, we would people, my, my senior members would tell me their parents would slap them in the mouth. If they asked about the massacre, mm. that's how much fear mm. they instilled in their children. So they say, well, I never asked about it again. Because I asked about it one time, and I got popped in the mouth. I said, don't you ever mention it again in your life? And, 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 this and that's wanna, in their own house. This is interject so people don't don't get this twisted. What the Reverend is describing is wanting to protect their children from danger in present day or in the present day, like uh, uh, of 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 reprisal from 
bigots and racists in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who might, who might, am I, am I on the right track here, Reverend? Yes, sir. Who might assault those children yes, in, the, in the present day, 50 years later, 60 years later, still a worry 30 years later after the incident. So it wasn't, it wasn't, okay, um, I know sometimes people have, um, I know in the, in the church we call it generational curses. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we talk about things that happen within the family that are, mm -hmm. are things people are not proud of, that are happy about. But this is not that. This no. is <laughs> external pressure that black people feel from the yeah. community. So, and, and so as, as Reverend describes this, I'm just eating this up, Reverend, because um, we have people um, who I've been introducing to the reparation struggle. I, I, I interviewed Dr. Sandy Dirty. We talked about reparations. Dr. Oh, Derek right. Hamilton. Um, I'm working with the Reset Race podcast, which focuses primarily on reparations uh, for American descendants of chattel slavery. And and we had these conversations. And I have I still and I have a mixed audience. And I've been educating them because I feel like we need to educate black folks and white folks, yes, not sir. just yes, black sir. folks, right? Absolutely. Because we, we, America has a lot of white people in it. And if we want a justice claim, just a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit. We, we might want to have some white people working with us. Now, not everybody, and we ain't gonna change our rhetoric. We ain't gonna change yeah. the way we talk when we talk yeah. to the white people. We gonna talk to the white people the same way we talk to the black people, and we all gonna get right. the same message. That's one That's thing right. I see. I got a problem with some folks. They want to talk different to the white mm -hmm. folks. Well, listen here, yo. So, mm -hmm. so, so back to this, brother. This massacre. Let's get into detail. You need a perfect guess for this. Gosh, I hear I hear tell of how many blocks of businesses were bombed in Tulsa. I hear talk of businesses and homes were raided before they were bombed. That there was a common combination, not just the destruction, but the the ransacking of belongings. Then, of course, we talk about the loss of life. Could you go into a little bit more detail? I want people to feel what happened in Tulsa. Yeah. I want them to walk away from this conversation knowing exactly what that was. Please, Rev. Yeah, so if if I may, um, and thank you for that question. A lot of a lot of people that you probably talked to or heard from, they start everything in 1921 because that's when the massacre happened. But what you have to do is you have to go back two years prior, 1919. And in fact, go back even further back than that to 1914 when the movie Birth of a Nation came out. A lot of folks don't know. I'm not, I'm not talking about the recent Birth of a Nation about Nat Turner. The original Birth of a Nation was about a, a, a supposed black man, which was actually a white man in blackface, because they didn't want to hire black actors back then. And they depicted black men as, as very lazy, uh, lethargic, aggressive, violent, just eating watermelons and fried chicken and exaggerated nose shape and desiring to have white women, right? And so this one black man, which is a white man in blackface, uh, is seeking to assault a white woman, damsel in distress. She, because she didn't want to be deflowered by this beast of a man, jumps off of a cliff, commits suicide. The clan arises to the and protect her honor and to weed out this brute of an angry black violent man. The Klan is applauded in this movie. Birth of a Nation was played in the White House, given an award by the president, Woodrow Wilson. It was highly heralded as one of the best films of all time, right? Um, and it created a perception of black men of which we were supposedly lazy, um, uh, trifling, aggressive, and only want to put our hands on some white woman, right? And that narrative stuck. That narrative was also used, if you read the narrative and minutes of, of local school board minutes and state legislatures, the, one of the main arguments against integration was that these white men didn't want black boys in the same class with their white daughters. Mm. Mm -hmm. because they had that same perception of birth of a nation. That was the first major motion picture in America. And talk about how popular culture shapes perception. That America's perception of black people really hasn't shifted much from the original birth of a nation. So you go from 1914, birth of a nation, 1919, World War I ends, 
black men who fought, come back. Black men who, who fought valiantly, come back to America. And they're, they were they were leaders in France. They were they aided lunch counters with white folk in Germany. They 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 so they come back to America, and they're not they're not looking down when they see white folk. They're not getting off the sidewalk when they pass by a white man, which was the cultural norms at that time. If you were walking on the sidewalk, and a white person walking on the sidewalk, a black person is supposed to get off the sidewalk and let the white person walk by. If a white man speaks to you. You're not supposed to look a white man in the eye. And you better not go near a white woman. Don't even brush her shoulder. You get off the sidewalk and you, you let them have the full way. Period, point blank. These black men came back from World War One. They kept walking. Mm. They would speak or nod to white women. They would, they, they, they knew who they were. And because of that. From 1919 to 1924, America saw over 50 plus race massacres across the country. Because these black men came back knowing who they were. So it's East St. Louis. It was, it, it, of course, we know about Rosewood. It happened in, 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 in Atlanta. It happened all over the country right when these black men started coming back. And all of them had as their genesis pretty much black men, uh, some lie about a white woman and a black man. And so now in Tulsa, 1921, same narrative. Black man, shoe shine boy Dick Rowland, elevator operator Sarah Page. He gets on the elevator. Some folks say he stepped on the shoe, he stumbled, whatever. She screams because she's on the elevator with a black man. Door opens. He runs because he knows this is about to be some mess. So he gets the heck away from her. And and she said something initially, but she never filed charges because she knew she was lying. But just that mere initial interaction was enough for the for the paper to print nab Negro for a sodden white girl. Mm, 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 mm. And they arrest his brother mm. and they put him in the county jail. He wasn't in jail a few hours until a white mob came and they were about to hang him. Black men just from World War, right? These veterans who had heard about the, and in fact, 1919, that summer is called the Red Summer of 1919. It was so many race massacres. Fact check me, Google me right now. Type in Red Summer of 1919. You will see what I'm talking about. Black men in Tulsa had heard about the Red Summer of 1919. They formed a brotherhood, a defense, African brotherhood. They said, this ain't happening in Tulsa. They marched down to the courthouse just to protect Dick Rowland and the sheriff and his deputy because they had a white mob of thousands of white men ready to come in and get Dick Rowland out. The sheriff, the white, so black men in 1921, I want to put this in context so your artist knows. Black men in 1921, veterans from the World War, go to the courthouse to help law enforcement protect the life of a black man. Black men were back in the blue in 1921, right? But what did the blue say to the black man? The sheriff told the black man, go home. I don't need your help. We good. And the black man like, you sure? Because we see hundreds of white men, thousands of white men out here about to bum rush you because in 1921, they felt, and some do today, that justice is too good for black people to have. Why waste taxpayer dollars on a jury and a judge and a bailiff? Mm -hmm. Let's get a rope and find a tree and let's hang this blank. Mm -hmm. So the white men came to take him out and just hang him. Like, why we ain't got to have a jury? Why we fake it like we got a true justice system for black folk? That's what they were saying. Why we front like this boy going to actually get a fair day in court? Let's just save everybody's time and get a rope and hang him. And sadly, that's the criminal justice system of black men today. Why we front that these that their brothers got a fair shake when you go before a judge or a jury? Why we even acting like they impartial? Mm. They still had the same perspective of 1914, birth of a nation. Black men, trifling, lazy, good for nothing, and all want to put their hands on white women. Why we acting like that's changed? So these black men said we're gonna come and defend Dick Roller and help support Sheriff law enforcement. 
Sheriff said, we'll need your help. Black man said, you sure? Sheriff said, go home. On the way home, one of the white men tried to grab the gun of the black men. First he says, what are you doing with that gun? And he called him N-word. But he didn't say N-word. You know, he of definitely course. the problem can spell. Um, I don't want to offend your audience um, by saying it. But um, the man, because see, in 1921, as in 2021, a lot of white people feel that gun ownership is not meant for black people. That's true. So we got the Second Amendment. You got sticks and 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 and, and, and swords. We shooting with guns and missiles. You just can talk all day long. The white man asked him, "What are you doing with that gun?" And this is a, this is a, this is in America. This is not some pre-state hood Oklahoma. This is not some territory, Native American territory Oklahoma. This is United States of America. Second Amendment. White man questioned black man why he got a gun. Black man said, "It's my gun, and I use it if I have to." White man was really flabbergasted. Then tries to take the gun from the black man. Gun goes off. White man gets shot. Didn't die, but he got shot. Then literally all hell breaks loose. And at the beginning, to be honest, the black brothers put up a good fight. Um, they retreated all back to Greenwood area, put up a decent fight. But when these white folk got airplanes, Mr. Black, when they got air, when they got access to airplanes, airplanes that were owned by corporations and other folk, and they use airplanes to drop bombs or incendiary devices on Greenwood, which was the first time, I must say, in American history that airplanes were used to terrorize Americans. Mm -hmm. the, fl the planes were not flown by Al-Qaeda. Mm. They weren't flown by the Japanese. That was the Pearl Harbor. Al-Qaeda was 9-11. The planes were flown by good old boy. Mm. Al White Cracker. Men. Mm -hmm. And the first victims of aerial terrorism in this country are black folk. You may never learn that in history class. We just commemorated 20 years from 9-11. And so when they got the airplanes, yes, yeah, you stated, they and, 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 and the houses that didn't get bombed by the airplanes, they would go into the houses at gunpoint until everybody get out the house. Sometimes they would shoot into the house and say, hurry up and get out. Sometimes they would go into the house and bring them out. Sometimes they didn't come out quick enough, they shot in there. Sometimes they came out when they were supposed to come out, they still shot the people and then got everything out of the house. They would drive pickup trucks up to the houses and ramsack everything inside the house. And it was so bad, brother, that a lot of the folks, a lot of the, the women who were helpful white families said they saw their husbands cufflinks and monogram shirts in the houses of white people. Mink coats being worn by white women. Mm. And sometimes the white folk were so devious, they tried to sell back the property of that they stole from black people to black people. And then they would usher the black folk out of their house, have them march with their hands up to go to concentration camp. And if they didn't go fast enough, they would shoot at them. Sometimes they still went fast, but they would still shoot. Um, there was this one story about a sister who um, stomach was cut open because she was pregnant. And they took the they cut her stomach open and took the baby out of her stomach and threw the baby to the ground, smashed baby's head in. I want to stop right there. Oh wow. You mentioned about the personal possessions that were taken from the black folks. Let's talk a little bit about the, the amount of affluence in this particular town. Because uh, I think people don't realize that there's a lot of success were taking place in Tulsa. It wasn't just because of the movie. I feel that like there was some social, uh, some jealousy of black people at that time in this particular place who were doing well. Could, could you speak to, uh, you know, uh, how, how black folks were doing business-wise and taking care of their families? Black, it, it, Tulsa Greenwood District had the highest per capita. Greenwood District is the place black folks live had the highest per capita home ownership of black people in any place in the country. Any place in the country. It, it, was, it was largely from the oil money um, that created a boom in this area. Uh, also, a lot of folks don't know, the black people were slave to Native Americans. And when the Native Americans, when emancipation came for us in 1865, some Native American tribes kept their slaves a year later and the black folks didn't get released in 1866. But they gave the black 
they called them freedmen, some land to grow crops on. So they had a little bit of money and they would come to Greenwood to spend their money. Um, and, and I go back to that other point about Native Americans having slaves. During the Trail of Tears, yeah, it was, it was a definitely Trail of Tears, but a lot of us don't realize black slaves traveled with the Native Americans along the Trail of Tears. We cut the trees down mm. for the Trail of Tears. We made it a trail by our sweat and our blood. So we can't miss that. There's been no suffering in this country that black folks, unfortunately, have been a part of. Mm. Period. Point blank. Point blank. And we still having a reparations from them yet either. So that's a whole nother conversation. That's a whole nother conversation, right? And so um, we had money for, a lot of us had land as freedmen from Native American tribes. We had crops we were growing on that. Then when this oil discovery happens, it just went crazy. And you have black folks in the service industry that were making bank. Like it was, just to give you one anecdotal fact, um, Greenwood at the time of 1921 had about 10,000 black people, 1,256 homes, 1,256 homes we had. Mm. All of them were destroyed, right? Well, some of them weren't. We had 1,256 homes were burned to the ground. Some of the homes, they looked, they were just so big, they the white folk thought the white people owned them, so they didn't burn those down, right? But out of 10,000 people, brother, we had, in 1921, folk who had their own cars. And six people in, out of the 10,000 had their own airplanes. Mr. Black, I can't tell you today in 2021, a community of 10,000 black folk and six of them only on airplane. Wow. Astonishing. Yes. That's the amount of wealth that we had. <sighs> uh, uh, and it was before, before welfare. Cause don't don't you have folks thinking that you got to depend on some government subsidy to be rich? It was before affirmative action. It was before any urban investment program or philanthropic grant. You know, so that's what I kill my 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 so called Republican friends on that 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 think in my in the Sean Hannes of the world that think the black folks have to have you know some government assistance to be rich. No, that's 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 never been us. Mm -hmm. We out of Greenwood shows you we a generation out of slavery, brother. Well, we most folks are still sharecropping. When it was against the law by Jim Crow for us to know how to read or write, we had black lawyers and doctors. We had we, we had people who owned their own airplanes, right? Uh, and so 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 don't you let anybody have you thinking. That 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 we need some type of handout to be to be successful. We we deserve a hand. I mean, I mean, we deserve services as citizens, but we don't need it to survive. You know, some people with some people have said, and, and um, I tend to agree that part of the success of of uh, Greenwood was the fact that we had segregation and we were forced to trade and do commerce within our own community. And that's how you circulate the money within the community. Circulated big time. And, and uh, once desegregation came about, you know, the, the, you know the saying, the white man's ice is always colder. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 um, first of all, thank you so much for, for giving us that story and telling us with such stark detail about what happened. I, I've never, I'm riveted by, by what you're sharing here, brother. I, I heard it. I didn't hear it. I didn't hear it, hear it, you know? Um, so you've been out here for three years protesting. What exactly are you asking Oklahoma to do? Well, first, uh, when I started, nobody was really talking about it much. Um, and they kept calling it a riot. I wanted them to recognize the massacre that it was. Um, this was no um, brawl. This was no um just vigilante shoot them up this was state sanctioned terrorism uh this the, the the mob was deputized by the sheriff's department so the same sheriff that told the black men to go back home 
and the black men who were trying to help protect him and Dick Rowland from the white mob, this same sheriff deputizes members of the mob. I mean, and so now everything they do is under the color of law. Right. Absolutely. So this is not just, you know, like Bloods versus Crips type of deal. This is this is state deputized white mob versus taxpaying veteran citizens. And they had all the resources that the state has to offer. Um, so recognize it as a state sanctioned massacre. Mm. And, 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 and that's the first thing. And that's something that's still not been a fully appreciated or accepted. Um, um, the city to this day does not own culpability. They say they're not liable for anything. Uh, sheriff's department definitely is not claiming culpability for anything. Um, uh, and so what you have is a state that committed mass murder and nobody goes to jail. So you mean to tell me, even after the public outcry, the public display that we just saw the Democrats do, mm -hmm. the commemoration, mm -hmm. showcasing, everyone becomes, well, not everyone, but a large percent of Americans became aware of what took place, and there has been no movement on this. I understand there's still, a, there's still at least one survivor, a direct survivor of that day that's mm -hmm. still with us. Mm -hmm. Even that individual, they have a reason why that individual cannot be compensated, no justice, no restitution for that individual? Brother, it is so sad. It is so sad that not only what you're saying, which is absolutely correct, um, we have never had and even an investigation into the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Now, mind you, this was the first time airplanes used drop bombs on America. So the last time was 9-11. What did we do after 9-11? We went to war in Afghanistan. 20-year war. We just got a couple of days ago, right? Spend trillions of dollars in Afghanistan. Man, spending billions of dollars bringing Afghanistan refugees to America, right? We killed Osama bin Laden. We killed Saddam Hussein and his sons, right? And we were an occupying force in Afghanistan for over 20 years. That's that's the last time, 9-11. This next to the last time, uh, we ain't gonna talk about Philadelphia because that was terrible what happened with them as well. Um, mm -hmm. But Pearl Harbor, 1942. Japanese government come in, drop bombs at Pearl Harbor, right? We commemorate that every year. We're going to do it this December also. What happened after Pearl Harbor? We went to Japan and dropped for the first time, first and last time in American history, we dropped the atomic bomb and we, it landed on Hiroshima. It was so powerful and devastating that to this very day, it is radioactivity in Chernobyl and it can be felt. Right. And to this very day, the Japanese government cannot have a standing military. Because the last time they did, they used it to drop bombs on us. Why do you think we got Samsung and all these other smartphones coming out of Japan? Because they don't have a military defense budget. They don't need to. We are their military defense. Because we said the last time y'all had a military, y'all used to drop bombs on us. So we're going to be your military. And we are. Their military, even though they want to have a military, brother, we said, nope, y'all can't do that. Mm. Last time y'all did, y'all drop bombs on us. So, and we rebuilt Japan after we bombed them. That's right. And we rebuilt Afghanistan. That's after right. After we bombed them. And we're bringing and them here. The Taliban just destroyed mm -hmm. it again, right? Mm -hmm. But for the very first time, airplanes used to drop bombs on American soil, right? First time, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Airplanes flown by white men. Airplanes owned by white businesses like Sinclair Oil Company, mm. the Green Dinosaur. I, I call names, brother. Sinclair Oil, according to the Race Ride Commission report of 2001, they say one of the airplanes were owned by Sinclair Oil. Look it up. Not one of those people who flew those airplanes 
were ever arrested. Not one of those members of the white mob was ever arrested. The last two times we went to war. We just got out of Afghanistan today. We still in Japan today. We spent trillions in Afghanistan. We have spent trillions in Japan. We have not done anything mm. for Greenwood at all. Not even, not even an invest, not even an investigation. Not, nobody's even been fingerprinted, brother. Mm. They ain't even been arrested. So don't tell me America is post-racial. Don't tell me America is not a racist nation. When the only difference between what happened in 9-11 and Pearl Harbor is the people who flew the planes in Tulsa were white. Mm. That's it. We had no problem going after Al-Qaeda. We had no problem going after the Japanese. But the folks who flew the planes in Tulsa were white. So America, with her racist self, gave them a pass. And every day since then, America has given the white man a pass and not investigated and not given. Not, so people talk about reparation being a check. It is a check, but it's also justice. If we are as much of a citizen of this country as everybody else, why is it when 9-11 happened, the next day almost we're in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. after Pearl Harbor, the next day almost we're in Japan, but the next day after not after after Tulsa Race Master, nothing at all. They still got off with the bounty from stealing from us. We just now, a hundred years later, excavate mass grave. That's because, and that's because folks like me been raising sand about it. So don't tell me America ain't racist. America still has a problem seeing black men and black women as victims. Yes. And has a problem seeing white men and white mm. women as villains. Mm. Mm. Tell it. Tell it. I also want to highlight the fact that Hollywood's role in this. And, and I had, of course, I, well, not of course, but I had heard of the movie Birth of a Nation. I understand, understand folks, that this movie, this didn't magically come about. <laughs> right. This movie was created as a form of propaganda in order to send a message to control black folks. They depicted us in a in a, a manner, as the good reverend describes, in order to further the notion that we are subhuman and that we are dangerous to white society. Mm -hmm. I see this, uh, Rev, Dr. Rev, I'm not going to bore you, but I've had some re recent events that played out where insert, they, assert, they will insert White liberals inserted a black woman in the place of the white woman in that movie and depicted me as that way. It's the brute attacking her. This is somebody who met my wife, who met my family. And, and just because I had a disagreement with her, they tried to paint me as the angry black brute. This is a trope that was used oh, to good effect and has been used. And, and this so incident took place that the good Dr. Reverend is describing took place because of a fabricated story of a black man who may have or may not have stepped on a white woman's shoe. Mm -hmm. A shoe, Johnson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, you, do you hear me? And and there has been no restitution. There has been no justice. So, Dr. Reverend, let me ask a question, because I could go on and on. Brother, I could go on and on. This is... The Democrats... And, and look, I'm by, I'm I'm nonpartisan, brother. I I go at I go at the Republicans, the Democrats, Mitch McConnell, Ted Cruz. These guys are disgusting. Uh, Larry Elder just ran for governor, uh, California. I'm so glad he lost. Um, but I call out I call out Democrats as well for this very reason. One side appears one side appears to to hate us and, and don't have a problem letting us know that. And the other side appears to be they they say they love us, but it appears to be the same way. Um, when it comes to actually doing things for us, performative, they do things that make it look as if they care about us, but they don't. I guess the question is this, they are still, you said in the outset that they are still throwing, that they are throwing credit cards, money at you. You mean to tell me the black, the white folks in Tulsa, Oklahoma, even after all of this, they are not, they are not, they're not embracing your message of reconciliation? <laughs> no. 
They're not trying to move beyond this. They don't want to. They don't. They don't feel ethically moved. They're not morally moved to do mm-hmm. something. Is that what you're telling me? No, I've seen more movement about COVID than I have about the race mask. Period. I've seen more attention and time and sensitivity to COVID um, on both sides of the aisle than I have in, than I have about the race mask of 1921. Um, I have, uh, thankfully, the, the weekly protest is black, white, yellow, brown, um, but in large part, no, it is, it is still a deafening silence. I mean, that's just the truth. That's just the truth. That's just how it is. And, and um, what about media? I mean, you're one of the you're one of the uh, foremost speakers on this issue. You, um, I saw that. Uh, I think it was CBS that picked up the story, and you and another brother were on that on that program. We were talking in depth about the issues. Has media been reaching out to you? A good friend, a mutual friend of ours, uh, contacted me for this. That's the mm-hmm. op- that's the reason why I had the opportunity to bring you on today. Has media reached out to you, Dr. Reverend since Turner? The, since the centennial, it's been very lagging. Uh, it was like they did it because it was in style. It was in vogue. Um, it was the hot topic. Um, but it's not been that consistent coverage uh, since the, the centennial. And that's sad because the issues are still prevalent. And not even just in Tulsa, but the issues of the black community as a whole. Um, we don't have that sustained attention to our issues. And 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 I saw it even when I went to Kenya and the times I went to Egypt. Um, black black suffering is not important to, to the Western world. You know, when I went to Kenya, I realized there was so much devastation and 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 and, and grief um in, in the beautiful mother continent of Africa, Kemet. Um, and it's just completely ignored by Western media. Completely ignored. That's why Rwanda was able to take place as long as it was, because it was ignored in large part. And the same thing in the hood. Our issues are ignored. Unless you're robbing a quick trip, unless you're robbing a bank, they ignore your issues. They ignore all of our issues. And the centennial was another example. They It was some hoopla for a week. But after that, in vogue moment left, um, it was on to something else. You know, they, 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 but one person they still keep in contact with, they keep in contact with the crown in England. They know everything that they're doing. They still keep in contact with the Kardashians. They know everything they're doing. But as far as black people are concerned, if your issue is not in style, if it's not in vogue, then they go on to the next hot topic. Absolutely. That's what they do. I've been, I've been, Blowing my own bullhorn about this, talking about how black issues are ignored, not just by corporate media, by media that independent. Like when you say when you think independent, you would think that people are rebellious. They're gonna mm-hmm. cover the stories mainstream won't cover. We're going we're gonna speak truth to power. We got no paymasters. I run this. And I can bring anybody on. That's the whole spirit of independent media, even in the independent media space. It's hard to get them to focus on black issues. They may spend a little bit of time on black death when it comes to cops. Mm-hmm. But even that's fleeting. On to the next killing, Johnson. They won't even, brother, I I covered the George Floyd case every day of the trial, every day of testimony. I didn't just play the tape. Every day I dissected the case and spent an hour talking about the case every day to the point Brother, it gave me some physical aftermath, okay? Because that discussion was stressful. It it weighed on me. The brother wasn't. Um, I, I'm not. I'm just a couple years older than uh, Mr. Floyd, and his heart. You know, his his health condition really had had me having some panic attacks. Like I'm like worried about my heart, my health, all these things. I had to go to the doctor get checked out. And the doctor was like, "You are stressed out, brother Tim." What are you doing? What do you do for work? I told him, he said, ah, you've been covering this case every day. So, and, and I was the only one doing that. Just every day dissecting this. So, so I looked around and, and I don't want to go too much on the tangent, brother, but I've been, I've been 
advocating for more coverage of black issues, um, speaking to speaking to the history, not just the history, the present as well, of what's going on. And I want to right now, I want to send this question. I have some folks that are now saying, well, I support reparations. And these are white, white content creators. Yeah. They're saying they support reparations. Where's your coverage? Mm. Where's where's your coverage? So I'm gonna name some names. Jordan Sheridan, if you now support reparations, great. Jen Perlman, you support reparations now, great. Tim Blacks will make a noise. Fantastic. Take the credit. I don't need the credit. You've come, you've come to this conclusion. You've always felt this way since you was knee-high to a grasshopper. You've always felt this way about black reparations and a black agenda. Fine. Uh, who else? Uh, the Humanist Report. That's three. There was at least one more. Who's the other one? I, I forget which is. That's three, though. I, I, I challenge you to contact Reverend Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Turner, bring him on your show to discuss this at length. Sam Cedar, these are major platforms. All these platforms I mentioned, except for two, are major platforms, bigger than me, five, 400,000. David Doyle, that's another one. There we go, he's almost at a half a million. Half a million. Wow. So if we combine those platforms, you're well over, you're to almost a, a quarter, uh, three quarters of a million potential subscribers listening to you. Not just 140 with me. So I want to challenge you. If you say you support reparations, you support black folks, Tim Black is exaggerating, we black people get coverage, okay, fine. If that's the case, I challenge you, TYT, I challenge you, Dr. Rashad Ritchie, brother, I challenge you, Senator Nina Turner, now a contributor on TYT, I want to challenge you as well, sister, to bring on. Dr. Reverend Turner to tell this story. I don't want to have all the fun. Why should the two black audience be the only audience that are grace with this great story that's able to become aware and educated and knowledgeable about this most important American history moment? That's right. Hey, I don't want to be selfish. We don't want to keep it to ourselves. So I challenge you all to invite the good doctor. Now, I know you're going to do it because you're not performing. You actually do care about these black issues. Tim's, I'm wrong when I assume your lack of coverage of black issues <laughs> is based in bigotry and racism and racial tropes and, or monetary gain or not wanting to ruffle the, ruffle the feathers of your mostly white racially biased or racially implicit bias. Some, I'm going to say some people are implicit. They don't know they're racist. I'm, okay. I'm I, you know. Okay, maybe it's a financial thing, but okay, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Prove me wrong. I will look. I will apologize. I will crow. I, I will apologize on air. Bring doctor on. Bring the doctor on. Let him talk. Don't cut him off. Shut up like I did and become educated. Allow the brother to tell the story. Do that for us, Reverend. Um, what are we doing now? What? I think all you need to do is get more publicity. I think that's all you, you just need to tell the story more. More people need to become aware of it. But in, in your minds, what would what would justice look like, Doctor? What what would that what would that be for you? Uh, it's a, it's really it's not as novel as some people try to make it out to be. I mean, America specializes in reparations. And people balk when I say that initially, but. What? We've done this so many times before. America we, specializes, I'm sorry, America specializes in reparations. I never heard anyone say that. Please explain what you mean by that, Doc. Um, thank you for that clarifying question. We, we've we done it before. We, 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 we've done it um, for the Japanese Americans after we put them in internment camps. A Republican president, Ronald Reagan, passed a bill, and then passed Congress, signed, he signed a bill that was passed by Congress, they pay every Japanese American family twenty thousand dollars who are placed in internment camp. If you don't believe me, Google it. Look it up. It's a fact. He, a Republican president and a Republican Congress, signed reparations for Japanese Americans every year. This Congress passes an appropriation for Jewish Holocaust survivors mm. to get paid. Right. So for those folks who say, well, why should I? And I and guess what? I support the I support that. I support Japanese Americans getting their check. I support Jewish Americans in their check. I ain't mad at none of that. The Holocaust was terrible. It was horrific. It, sh it should never have happened. I'm happy that Hitler lost and Nazi Germany was defeated. I'm thankful to God for that. Right. 
but Nazi Germany learned from America. Mm. Yeah, they did. So they learned from in fact, in fact, historians stated that, that 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 when they looked at our method of Jim Crow and punishment, they said that was too harsh for them to do in Germany. Right? I'm supportive of Japanese Americans getting their check. Being placed in internment camps is horrific. Especially when you as innocent as they were, they were just caught Japanese in America, and because of the World War, they were placed in internment camps. Totally wrong, right? Right. But you pay for them. Why can't you pay for black people? And on top of that, it gets worse. We paid reparations. I went to the University of Alabama. Roll tide, gotta say that. I love my campus, I love my state. But the University of Alabama, one of these buildings has on it, on a plaque, building built in rep as reparations to the South. You heard me right. To the South for the Civil War. We gave reparations to the Confederacy. And they were the ones who killed American soldiers. 700,000 American soldiers were killed in the Civil War. And we paid the Confederacy. We gave them, we gave the Confederate generals their land back, land that General William Tecumseh Sherman promised black folk in Sherman Field on 15, when Abraham Lincoln got killed, assassinated, Andrew Johnson gives it back part. He pardoned 4,000 Confederate generals. A U.S. president did that. Can you imagine mm. today Joe Biden pardoning the lieutenants of Al-Qaeda? Can you imagine Harry Truman pardoning the generals of the Japanese military? But we pardon soldiers in the Confederacy and paid them reparations, right? So miss me mm. with America not knowing how to do reparations. America doesn't have a problem. I go a step further. America does not have a problem with reparations. The only time America has a problem with, rep with reparations is when it's to black people. Mm. There it is. And that's more evidence to this country still being a racist nation. Don't talk to me about your theory. This ain't critical race theory. This is fact. This is American history. We paid the Jewish Holocaust survivors. We paid the Japanese Americans. We pay the Confederacy. We give us we give appropriations every year to indigenous Americans because we took their land. Right. But to this day, black people, we don't honor somebody that hadn't gotten a check. Mm. When we talk about Tulsa, we're talking about a group that you know. So I, I guess I don't know. Maybe they can't find out who the descendants are. Who the who the owners of the who would have inherited those homes or family members to the victims of the Tulsa massacre? Because you know no records were kept. Because you know that's what they like to do. They like to act like oh, there's no way. How would we even go about approaching this, Tim Black? It's no way. We don't have records. Oh, we got records. Mm -hmm. We got records. Well, how will we? Add <laughs> my uh, my folks at Reset Race. One of them. One of those. I don't want to know which one said it. But there was a great quote. They said, if you want to hear a progressive turn into a fiscal conservative, start talking about reparations. That's right. All day long. All of a sudden, people that want to talk about Medicare for all, sky's the limit. There is no limit to uh, what we, we should money. pay <laughs> to ensure Americans have medical coverage. Ah, ring the bell. If it's time to go to war, conservatives, ah, it's no limit. We need to defend Americans. <laughs> Patriots, you know, patriot, uh, we're patriots, and we need to defend America and 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 spread democracy around the world. Sky is the limit. You start talking about reparations. Whoa, 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 whoa. We, <laughs> we gotta sit down now. Let's, everybody, sit down. They start doing a. I'm gonna use that, brother. I mean, yeah, they start. <laughs> they start doing a little rail. Oh, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. We need to sit down. Let's let's talk now. We gotta. Oh, I I I feel like I saw asking my uncle four hundred dollars. We gotta have that conversation. Oh, have a seat, brother. Have a seat. Let's talk about this. Oh God. Oh, oh. All of a sudden, America, America gets real poor when black people start asking for money. Oh God, they got their hat in their hand, wringing their hat, wringing their hands. Oh Lord, we can't come up with no money now. Yeah. 
Go in there and break open that mason jar on top of the shelf <laughs> next to the oil, the grease. That's, right. That's how That's America right. starts talking. We talk about the richest nation in the history of nations. All of a sudden, you can't pay a bill. And we print our own money, brother. We print our own money. It's numbers in a spreadsheet. <laughs> we got a space force, God damn. So, so, brother, once again, when we talk about what, and, and look, and I know it's not just up to you what would be uh, yeah. justice. You know what I'm saying? I don't yeah, want to yeah. presume that, that that's arbitrarily lands on just one individual. But yeah. I'm sure you've, you've been talking to folks. Yeah. Thank you. I, I was thinking, let, let me answer the question. I, uh, the rest, the race at the time, Race Ride Commission of 2001 came out with five recommendations for what reparations look like. I try not to ever reinvent the wheel and respect my elders. First thing they said was direct payment to the survivors. Period. Direct. We and we have quantifiable how much they should get. Already been empirically done. Already. In fact, Tulsa has what the U.S. government doesn't have. I'm a huge supporter of HR 40. Right. Uh, the study bill. Rep, the, the remedy study bill for reparations. They're trying to figure out what should be done. Tulsa already knows what should be done. We've already had our commission back in 2001. And the, and the five recommendations were first one. Direct payments to the survivors. Number two, in the absence of the survivors, direct payments to their descendants. Number three, scholarship for the descendants to go to college for free. Number four, a business incubation for business in Greenwood, black business to come back and relocate and start their business. Number five, a memorial to house the remains of the bodies mm. that were dumped in mass graves. Period. So for anybody in Tulsa, and I, because I've met a few uh, who acted ambivalent or ignorant to what reparations is, what we're asking for, they're being disingenuous. And now Robert Turner, I got a full disclosure, Robert Turner, Reverend Dr. Robert Turner, adds the sixth one. The sixth one. I, this is mine. This is not this. This is mine. Which is criminal investigation mm. to the worst race mask in American history. Mm. That's what I add. And and so those so when I see reparations, that's what I mean, brother. That sounds very reasonable. That does not sound overreaching. It doesn't sound impossible. Uh, it sounds like a very reasoned request or demand for justice. I I, I don't know why anyone would have a problem with that. I think we need to put some fire under the under the ass cheeks of the people in power there in Oklahoma to get this done. And I'm, I'm sorry to use that language in front of the good Dr. Reverend, but that's what I think needs to happen. I think I, I'm all for public shaming, doctor. Like I, sometimes I think social pressure is the best pressure. And if we could pressure them to enter action, that would be beautiful. Maybe, maybe um, at some point we can, we can uh, put some addresses and names and contact information for the people that wield power in Oklahoma to help facilitate this so we can somehow encourage them. City of Tulsa, GT Biden Mayor, City of Tulsa, uh, City Council people, we have, um, we they need to hear, I have a petition also on change.org, um, Tulsa Reparations Now. Mm. Um, they need to hear that this is not, has this issue has not been forgotten about. No, no it hasn't. It's not been forgotten about. And I, I brother, I, you 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 just gave win to myself uh, today having me on your show, man. Really, really, really appreciate it. Especially after yesterday and going through hearing white woman call me an, an N word, and, that, and that's not even the first time some of that's happened. But I needed this show more than you know, man. I really do, and I'm I, I, I'm indebted to you actually. Well, I, well, brother, I'm I'm honored by that, and I, um, so I'm ecstatic that you chose this platform to share your story. We're all indebted to you for your work and bringing attention to this issue. Brother, we appreciate you. And also, once again, I want to thank you for your patience today and, and pushing through and delivering that so steadily, brother. I'm so impressed. Everybody um, everybody that's, that's listening to the show, we need to follow um, the good Reverend Dr. Turner. 
Rev, where are you on social? How would you like people to contact you? I'm sure you're going to be flooded with people trying to contact you now and people reaching out to bring you on their platforms. I know Yvette Carnell of the Breaking Brown, she's back live streaming. She has an organization, American Descendants of Slaves. People keep saying bring on Yvette Carnell. If Yvette Carnell brings on Dr. Reverend Turner, of course I bring on Yvette Carnell. We do a favor for a favor. Bring on Dr. Rev. Um, how could they contact you, uh, Rev? Instagram. Rev Dr. R E V D R Robert Turner, Instagram R E V D R Robert Turner, Twitter Robert R A Turner One, Robert R A Turner T U R N E R, and the number one. Um, and I have a website, Robert Turner Ministries net, and um, Facebook, of course, first and last name. And that's that's those are my best ways. Those are ways. Those are all viable, Reverend Doctor uh, Reverend Doctor Turner. I want to appreciate you once again, brother. Thank you so much for this, folks. You know where to go. I'm going to put this all in the description box below, underneath the video. All those links are going to be included. Thank you once again, Reverend Doctor Turner. This has been a riveting conversation, a great conversation, folks. I'll see you tomorrow for another edition of Pause, and then we open phone lines. I look forward to phone calls coming in. Um, you know what? I got some great, we're getting great responses already, Reverend. Uh, people saying uh, for the children. Uh, Sheldon Hughes says, what a powerful show. Cut the check. Um, Aaron Alexander, he said for the children. Uh, Kalam Thompson says, hey now, brother Tim, hello to you and your guests. FBA takeovers underway. Foundational Black Americans underway. And all supportive, all supportive comments in my comment section, Rev. Thank you Love once it. again. All right. One love, man. Appreciate you. One love. You got it, brother. That's it, guys. I'll see you soon. And we are out of here in three, two, one.